This is Let's Get Growing with horticulturalist Nathan Wilson at Lanier Nursery and Gardens in Flowery Branch. Get information you need for gardening, landscaping, and home plant care. We're taking your calls right now at 706-865-3181 or email info at wrwh.com. Now, here's Nathan. Good morning, gang. We are in the studio this morning ready to take your phone calls. Give us a call this morning at 706-865-3181 if you have something pestering you in the garden, maybe some little beetles or worms crawling around eating your plants, or maybe you have some things that aren't looking so good. I was ready to uh, get in the studio this morning and talk about how dry it's been, and last night we not only had rain, but we had some major storms. I know I woke up about 4 o'clock and it felt like I was becoming Dorothy, uh, leaving Kansas on her way to the land of Oz, and uh, it was a pretty wild night. But I got back to sleep and ready to go this morning. Let's talk a little bit about water. You know, this time of year, it's kind of hit or miss, just like we had last night. We got Somebody told me they got two inches of rain, which is wonderful, but when it all hits at once, it doesn't really seep into the ground. It doesn't really uh, do what we want it to do. But it's okay. We thank the Lord for it, and we continue to garden. So how did gardening go this week? Did you do anything good? What was bad, and what was ugly? Let's talk about it this morning. Give us a call at 706-865-3181, or you can email your question to us at info at wrwh.com. This morning, I'm glad to say I'm joined in the studio with my producer, the true talent, born talent in this room, Buster Talent. Buster, has this show helped you garden any? Are you getting out there and doing any of that kind of stuff? Uh, not really. <laughs> That's what but I, I did, you know, I was able to pass along that bit of information you told me on the, your first program uh, to be yeah. patient with the hummingbird feeders, yep. to just keep an eye out. Yeah. When you see butterflies, the birds are not too far behind. And I told him that. I've never heard that before, son. I ain't ever heard that. And uh, lo and behold, like you said, you saw, we saw some butterflies, and yeah. the birds were not too far behind. So it all worked out. So even though I'm not applying the knowledge in my life, I'm passing it along to people, and it has helped. Well, you know, that really so sh- let's get growing. Yeah, let's is get helping growing. my life grow. Oh, I'm glad. I know you're fishing for compliments. I'm this fishing morning. for compliments. Can't you tell? And I'm really surprised because hey, something I said actually was true. Well, this morning, I'm <laughs> just kidding. Let's give us a call at seven zero six eight six five three one eight one or email us at info at wrwh dot com. If you don't want to talk with me, you can you can text me. But uh, we like to uh, talk about growing here, obviously. And if you're not growing your own fruits and vegetables, well, don't worry because there are farmers around us. We love our local farmers. I do because I'm kind of like a plant farmer. I grow little baby plants instead of uh, tomatoes and things like that. But if you're not growing your own, that's okay because there are farmers markets around you just like the one here in Cleveland at Freedom Park. And Janet's on the phone this morning with us to tell us a little bit about what's going on. Hey, Miss Janet, how are you? Hey, I'm fine. How are you? Great, great. Would you? Uh, what's happening down there at Freedom Park today? Well, the farmers market is busy. Uh, right. When we started out, we didn't much expect a lot, a lot of uh, vendors or customers, but we have a lot of both. Um, in produce, we have uh, watermelons are in. We got some peaches, mm. uh, blueberries. Uh, we have corn, green beans, okra, tomatoes. All the stuff you expect in the summertime. Mm, that sounds delicious. You know, the great thing about farmers markets is not that not just the fresh produce and the products there, but people can also meet the people who grew it, the farmers, right? Right, and that way you you know what you're getting, and you know what hasn't been uh, sprayed with a lot of uh, insecticides, all kinds of pesticides, uh, and it wasn't shipped thousands of miles to get yeah. to you. Absolutely. You know, that's kind of the the deal with uh, what we do at the nursery is we're local folks and we we do work with local growers, what we can't grow ourselves. And uh, the big box stores, you never know where they are. So it's like the grocery business here. You know, in the grocery store, you don't know that. You're exactly right. It may be a a Mexican potato or a tomato or it may come from Brazil. But when you go to Freedom Park and visit the Cleveland Farmer's Market, you are buying produce that came up or down the street. Isn't that right? That's right. And we have some locally made uh, handcrafts, too. 
What kind of um, craft work is, is going on out there? We have a uh, lady selling um, soaps and salves yeah. that are made from er- natural herbs uh, and essential oils. Yeah. We have uh, bouquets arranged by uh, a local lady and grown by her. Wonderful. Now um, we have uh, some other. We have some ceramics. Uh, lots of good stuff. The bread lady's here. The bread lady. People love the bread lady, don't With- they? <laughs> I think everybody knows that bread lady, and she has some wonderful-looking baked goods. Now, um, uh, what about a local honey? Is there a a local beekeeper there as well? Sometimes. Now, Randy Bragg, who's a woodworker, he's not here today, but he sometimes has uh, honey. Okay. He has uh, Allison's honey. Yeah, well, that's I haven't seen any, I haven't noticed any honey out here today. Mm -hmm. Uh, Somebody might have it, but I haven't noticed it. Right. Well, that's great. Well, it sounds like there's plenty to, that you have to offer there with many vendors. And even though we had that storm that may have uh, thought that we wouldn't be having uh, such a great turnout, sounds like we are. So can you tell people how to get there from downtown square? I think it's pretty easy, isn't it? Okay. On the on the square, just come out east on Keitel about a block, and it's right there. So you could really Can't just miss it. park on the square and walk over to Freedom Park, right? Oh, sure. Sure. It's just a block or two. All right, folks. Well, thanks. But there's, for, there's uh, plenty of parking here, too, of course. Yeah, absolutely. So you can park right on the market. Well, thanks for joining us, Janet. And I hope that uh, you'll join Janet out there and she will get to see your smiling face as you shop locally and locally produce, locally grown produce, handcrafts, jams, jellies, things like that. Y'all have a good one out there, Janet. All right. You too. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye. Uh, so that's what we like to do here. We like to grow and not only. Um, Not only do we like to grow, but we like to support people who grow themselves. So we've got a phone call here this morning. Wonderful question. We have Lamerle on here. I hope I'm pronouncing that right, Lamerle. How are you? I'm great, thank you. Great. What's going on in your place? Okay. Farmer Frank wants to know, what can we do about all these webs that are forming on our pecan trees? I guess there's still worms in there. And the branch will just die where that web has has wrapped around them. What yes. can we do? Absolutely. Now, let me tell you what you're seeing. Some people call this uh, bagworm or tent worm, but the actual term for the ones that grow because they're right on the tips of the plant, isn't that right? Yes. Okay, so what you have is fall webworm. And I'll tell you what I did. I wrote an article this past week and posted it on our webpage at LanierNurseryGardens.com, and you can learn more about it there. But I'm going to tell you a little bit about it here. Um, Fall webworm is... Uh, not really a problem for the tree. It just looks really bad. Now, if the tree is young and just covered with it, it's possible you may want to treat that. But to be honest, this uh, if you get close up to it, and, uh, and on uh, our uh, Facebook page I have a video where I pulled one of these webs apart, and uh, I understand some kids love the kids were watching over and over because they love to see these little worms inside this uh, bag, and there's just a ton of I mean hundreds of brothers and sisters all crawling around and what they leave are skeletonized leaves which you see as the brown leaves there and they're eating away at the leaves and they leave fecal droppings so just be careful (laughs) when you get out there and start if you want to cut some down that you when i cut that one down i had some fecal droppings (laughs) fall on my face anyhow so the thing is is there are over 50 predators and 36 parasites that will consume this particular insect and so they just are temporary rarely housing and yes they are eating the tips and it looks really bad but they're not going to take a large pecan down sometimes they're in cherry trees but if your tree is young and just covered with them what you can do is you can cut out what you can get to and then you can start using some biological control and here's the two biological controls first of all you can use a spray it's called bt which is a fancy it was a short term for bacillus thuringiensis which is simply a bacteria that gets inside of this little worm and and kills the worm So it's a biological control. But the other uh, biological control you could use would be to bring over a 10-year-old kid or some kid and throw them on the ground and let them do a little garden dance on top of them and take care of them that way. But if it's a large tree, which it probably is, uh, it sounds like it may be a mature tree, 
I would just say get what you can get out for aesthetic purposes, but uh, the ones in the tops, they're not going to do harm. They'll probably be back next year. Um, it's just something we see because this particular insect has like at l- maybe two different generations in a year. So you may see them coming around as we get closer and closer to fall even. What they do is they they turn into little cocoons, the little worms you see, once they crawl off your tree, and they go in the ground, and they make these really pretty black, I mean just true black cocoons, and they hang out there, and then... Uh, next year, those cocoons will emerge into the fall webworm moth, which is this beautiful pearly white moth with these brown spots on it. But, like I said, there are 50 predators that take care of it and 36 parasites. So, really, your tree's going to be safe. It just looks bad. I know it does because at the nursery, <laughs> we've got several pecan trees that are loaded with them. But let Farmer Frank know that his tree is okay um, unless it's a young tree. I, I-, I wouldn't do anything about it. So, how does, does that help, Lamar? It does, and we did break off at the bottom where we could reach. We broke off yeah. one or two and just mm-hmm. you know, destroyed it. Good. Okay. Yeah, so Thank I would, you very much. And if you'd like to read my article on it, uh, you can go to LanierNurseryGardens.com. And at the okay. top of the page, there's a uh, button that says Articles. You click there, and you can read more about it. I add a little bit of humor because it's kind of a funny subject. And, and like I mentioned, there's a video of me playing with <laughs> dissecting one of those uh, web worms on our pecan tree. And I had somebody tell me yesterday that their, their kids watched it three times. They just loved it. So. <laughs> Maybe share that with some kids you know. So, But thanks, Lamar. We appreciate it and hope to hear from you soon. Thanks for Thank listening. You. Uh-huh. Mm, bye-bye. Webworm. I don't know what it was, uh, Buster, but this week when I posted this about webworm, actually looking at my inbox this morning, someone says, love your article because we sent it out. Unweaving the Webworm's Web is the title of that article. And I don't know what it is about it, but uh, yesterday the, this lady said, hey, her kids, she, they watched it over three times. They just loved it, you know? It's like discovery is really what it is, I think, you know, discovering something. Well, uh, be sure to let me have a link of, to that article, and we'll have that up on WRWH's Facebook page for those of you that are curious as to, hey, we didn't know Nathan was a writer. <laughs> yeah, I didn't know either, but we we have to tell them. Jack message. of all trades, master of none. Uh, none of none. That is well, exactly right. He's a, he's a master gardener, ladies yeah. and gentlemen. And, hey, listen, <laughs> we, we can put that on the YouTube channel as well in a link below because you can listen to all of the recordings, that we're, uh, all of the uh, shows we're doing as a recording at YouTube.com and uh, WRWH's web, uh, YouTube page. So we'll have a link to it there. You know, I was thinking, uh, while you give us a call at 706-865-3181, you can get all of your questions answered. Just consider me like your personal gardener. Garden coach and Garden Svengali. <laughs> and I'm not going to charge you a dime. So <laughs> give us a call or send us uh, a message at info at wrwh.com and we'll be back with more of your fabulous questions. Local news, sports, and community information 93.9 FM and AM 1350. We are WRWH Cleveland. <laughs> Back to more, let's get growing with Nathan Wilson. Hey, gang, welcome back. We're glad you are still hanging on tight with us. You know, uh, of course, WRWH is available AM and FM, which is maybe how you're listening, but there are other ways to listen as well. Of course, at www.wrwh.com uh, on your smartphone or your computer but you can also listen to us live at the tune in app if you have a smartphone just go to the uh android or apple store and just type in tune in and once you download the app wrwh the first thing that pops up crystal clear audio anywhere you've got data that is beautiful well i tried it myself it was very effortless very effortless you know you can if you can't reach it uh you say say you drive out of town even you can still listen to us while you're on vacation on the internet on the tune <laughs> Or you can listen and tune in in places where you can't take your radio, like the doctor's office in the waiting room, (laughs) or your desk at work, or maybe a funeral service, or dare I say a restroom. You can, in other words, I can be with you at all times. It's a little scary. But with TuneIn and Technology Today, you can listen to us however you like. Give us a call this morning at 706-865-3181, or email us. That's easy, too, at info at wrwh.com. You just put this funny mental image in my head. (laughs) 
that. You know, just somebody <laughs> pulling an earbud out of there. What's that, Doc? I'm listening to Swap Shop. Can you, what, what's that diagnosis <laughs> yeah. again? Yeah, what was that? I, I, I really want to buy this thing on Swap Shop. But uh, regardless, folks, give us a call at 706-865-3181. Today we're going to introduce two new segments. Uh, one segment we're going to call Plant of the Week, and that will come in later half of the show where I'm going to present to you a new plant. Well, it may be new. It may be old to you. But regardless, I'm going to tell you a little bit about how you can use it in the garden, what you can do with it, how it grows, how big it gets, what color bloom, if it has a bloom, is it evergreen, does it drop its leaves, does it have great fall color, et cetera, et cetera. And then I'm going to tell you a little bit about the history and folklore maybe um, or medicinal value, maybe medicinal value for some of these plants. Another, another segment we have is going to be called a Garden Southern Soliloquy which is presented by one of our uh, very own listeners. Her name is Ethel, and she will present to us something interesting or unique in her life and how she deals, how she deals with uh, gardening in her neck of the woods. So we'll You've just be mail. prepared for that later. Okay, folks, we go to our mailbox, which, of course, is info at wrwh.com. There is a question here that asks, I know it's really hot and sunny this time of year. It's a, I have a new construction, a uh, new house is what it sounds like here. I'm going to try to summarize all this. And we have no trees. That's a very good, good, uh, good question. What can I plant, they say, for shade? So this time of year, when it's hot and sunny, we say we want some shade. And if you have a new construction like this, uh, this individual does who did not provide their name, but... Uh, if you do, we can definitely suggest some trees that are going to give you shade. And it's a great time of year to go ahead and plan on it. Even though fall may be the better time to plant, let's go ahead and make a plan. How about that? Plan before you plant. Shade trees. Okay, so we have some shade trees that are It's called a, a, the Nuttall Oak. Nuttall Oak is a great shade tree because it uh, grows pretty quickly for an oak. And will give you that classic oak look, of course, uh, which people strive for. But sometimes oaks grow slower, which is the way they do. But with Nuttall, right down Nuttall, that one is a native oak and it's quicker to grow. So you can have a hot, sunny day today, but cool shade tomorrow. Another type of shade tree you can use would be the red maples. Red maples are glorious. Why? Well, they are native, but they do provide shade. They're a smaller tree, not as large as an oak tree, but they still get high enough to give you good shade and in the fall time let me tell you folks if you're looking for red beautiful d delicious fall color the red maples are going to give you that there's a few several varieties out there but some that we of course have available um, at the nursery are called summer's red and autumn blaze and both of those uh, even combined are glorious i worked with a client here in cleveland just down the street from here uh, he had a situation like like this uh, this uh, email here where he has a beautiful house, but no trees. And we were able to hook him up. Uh, he's got them planted. He's going to water them this summer. But some of the uh, trees that we put out there were the red maples. It's a great plant. Now, I'm going to suggest one more for a beautiful shade tree. That would be called the Ginkgo Biloba. 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 It's almost like a little song. Very catchy. But Ginkgo tree, as it's commonly called. It's also used in some uh, kind of natural healing and herbal things. But... It's a beautiful tree. This tree is slow to grow, but it is worth it. Uh, one of my first um, acquaintances with ginkgo was actually on the campus of, well, now it's called the University of North Georgia in Oakwood. At the time, it was called Gainesville College. But uh, there, they had this beautiful stand of ginkgos. And the only reason I, I caught it, because me and a friend were taking some photographs around the campus with our fancy new cameras at the time. And it was fall time, so it was like early in the season, uh, school season. And this leaf is fan-shaped um, and g g glowing yellow. Glowing yellow in the fall. Glowing yellow. I tell you what, if you are looking for a true yellow, I mean golden yellow, it's just gorgeous. Ginkgo. The gr another good story about ginkgo is it's super old. 
It's super old. It, it supersedes any of my grandparents. It goes way back to the dinosaur days. It goes back. I mean, this ginkgo biloba would have been a place where mama dinosaur brought her babies to let them play and let them pl- kind of sleep in the shade. So uh, ginkgo, red maple, and nuttall oak are all great shade trees. Some of them faster growing than others, but they all attract some reason in the landscape so i hope that answers uh your question uh from well didn't have a name here but have answers your question about shade trees and making that sunny hot area of your house a whole lot cooler this time of year again folks if you got a question that is burning burning hot just like it probably will be later today give us a question at 706-865-3181 and we'll be glad to answer it or you can send us an email at info at wr wh dot com uh, this is not a nobody's asked about this, but I want to go ahead and talk about a problem we have it's called the boxwood blight there's a problem going around the state and it's kind of started in the southeast north of us but um, boxwood blight can just decimate uh, nursery crops of boxwoods it can get into your landscape if you have boxwood um, keep an eye out on them in our immediate area gainesville and the surrounding hall counties i have not seen uh really this problem yet but it will show itself with uh, decaying foliage and foliage that gets spots on it it's a, a fungal issue that is pretty easily spread from plant to plant but if you bring it in from a nursery that had it it can just take away the others so we do sell boxwood. All of ours are nice and healthy, and we keep a close eye on them, but we don't have many because of that reason. I only carry one type. But um, you can use alternatives, and hollies make great alternatives. There's a native uh, holly called Yopon holly, which is, uh, if, if you know, if you weren't a trained professional like myself, you would have no clue that it was any different. It looks so similar, all these hollies. Another one is Hugendorn holly. Terrible name. I know you won't remember it, but you come to the nursery. I'll help you out with that. Hugendorn holly stays really small and tight, and soft touch holly stays small and tight. So if you already see some issues with your uh, boxwoods, feel free to um, use some of these alternatives, and we'll be glad to help you out at Lanier Nursery and Gardens to uh, give you some suggestions for sure. So that's boxwood life. We we'll try to get rid of that. We are going back to the mailbox, and we are looking here from John in Gainesville. He says, can you grow dogwoods from seed? Can you grow dogwoods from seed? Well, you absolutely can, John. You can grow dogwoods from seed um, because that's how Mother Nature does. And if you look through your forest, look in your... In, out in the wilderness, you will see little baby dogwoods and older dogwoods, and they do. If uh, this, see, we're getting close, I guess. But uh, you know, in the in the spring, dogwoods bloom as gorgeously, uh, naturally, a white flower. There are some other color forms now that we have uh, horticulture getting involved with dogwoods. However, um, however. Uh, about this time of year, you'll start to notice where those flowers were, there's these little swollen seed-like structures. We, they're actually fruits, and these fruits are forming, and they're going to eventually become a nice ripe red color, ripe red color just like a, a, a tomato almost. Now, with that being said, is it going to be easy? Well, Maybe, maybe not. Is it going to be slow? Probably to get them started. But if you go ahead and as soon as those uh, little red seeds are nice and, and, and bright red, that means they're ready to harvest and you can extract them and you can go ahead and plant them um, in the ground now so that they'll stay kind of cool through the winter, which will trigger them to uh, jump up in the spring, hopefully, and start to grow. Now, most uh, b- birds are probably going to want to eat those little red berries as well. So you may want to get out there and make sure you grab it before, grab it before uh, the, the, the babies, the baby bird, the mama birds go and feed their babies. So, John, can you grow dogwoods from seed? Yes, you can. It'll probably be slow. It'll probably be tough. If, if you um, don't want to go that route, 
you can always come to the nursery, Lanier Nursery and Gardens, and we and we can definitely uh, help you out with getting something a lot quicker. Now, folks, I want you to hang on because we have uh, Ethel's Southern Garden Soliloquy coming around, and it's going to be in the next segment, so hang on tight through the break. We'll be right back, 706-865-3181, or email us, info at wrwh.com. Ethel's coming up next after the break. Local news, sports, and community information. 93.9 FM and AM 1350. We are WRWH Cleveland. More great information coming your way on Let's Get Growing with Nathan Wilson. All right, folks, welcome back to Let's Get Growing. As I promised, Ethel is on her way. But before uh, we let her take control of the microphone, let's go and give you our number to call us at 706-865-3181 or email us at info at wrwh.com and we'll be glad to take your growing gardening questions. And now for a Southern Garden soliloquy from Ethel. Because when gardening gets rough... She puts the rough into gardening. Dear, poor, pitiful little plant, I had such big dreams for you when I purchased you for 25 cents off the clearance rack at the big box store. Such big dreams. Large, voluptuously flowering dreams. I hope that your two little leaves would have grown into a tropical forest by now. But here they are, your two little leaves. I even think they're a little less green now. I went and bought you a gloriously glazed pot for sixty-nine ninety-seven that was handcrafted by a child worker living in the jungles of Taiwan. And this is how you repay me? That overpriced moisture control potting soil didn't really grow any miracles, now did it? I mean, I know your plant tag said you prefer the shade, but I've got you placed in the full blazing hot sun. Can't you handle the heat? I mean, a little sunshine couldn't hurt, now could it? Oh, why could you just not have cooperated? I did everything that the 16-year-old clerk said to do. And who could possibly know more than him? Oh, well, perhaps next time I'll buy my plants from a local plant nursery where the folks there provide quality plants and know what they're talking about. But for now, I've still got my hopes. Grow, you poor, pitiful little plant, you. Sincerely, Ethel. Well, thanks, Ethel, for that garden soliloquy. And I hope you'll join us next week for another edition of Southern Garden Soliloquy with Ethel. Give us a call this morning at 706-865-3181 or info at wrwh.com. Let's get to the lines here. We've got Thomas on hold. Are you still with us, Thomas? Hey, good morning, Nathan. Hey, Thomas, how are you? Doing well, thank you. Good. You've got a question about tomatoes, I understand. I do. I first want to say thank you. It's it's always fun to hear your show, and uh, this morning has been hilarious. I've been cracking up the whole time. <laughs> well, we have too. <laughs> but but I want to say, absolutely, I want to say a big thank you. A couple weeks ago, I was able to come by Lanier Nursery and Garden, oh. and um, I was actually on the, the first show, and um, and your advice from that radio show helped. I got Great. some calcium, and I applied it to the tomatoes, yeah. and it definitely helped. The tomatoes um, got some wonderful tomato sandwiches that mm. uh, my wife and I have been having fun watching them grow. And, uh, Sounds so tasty. My question, yeah, thank you. My question is, now that we're getting later in the year, obviously the calcium helped uh, keep them green and, and helped fight that blossom in right. Yeah. But now it looks like, of course, I went on vacation. So, so oh. I just got back uh, to Georgia not too long ago. And what do I need to do to try, because they're better boy tomatoes. What do I need to do to try to keep them growing healthy and strong later into the season? Sure, sure. Well, uh, one of the things is continue to keep them mulched, being mulched. If they're not mulched, then uh, the soil is getting hot, it's getting dry, and that mulch can help to moderate soil temperature and the moisture in the soil. You know, we, I, I, I assume you probably had a gully washer maybe like I did last night. But uh, if you if you didn't, then, of course, watering is going to be a key. And going through the, the dog days of summer as we get into August, and, of course, September is still going to be warm, I'm sure. As we go into there, we're going to have to make sure that our little baby plant, well, they're not babies anymore, really, but our mature um, produce. Pro, 
prolifically producing tomatoes are getting plenty of moisture. So continue to water and fertilize. Continue to fertilize your plants. Um, you don't necessarily need a whole lot of nitrogen uh, in that fertilizer this time of year because you've got well-established growing plants. So you want something well-balanced, something with uh, a little bit of nitrogen but some phosphorus and potassium. You know, people wonder about what the quest- uh, about what those numbers are on a bag of, say, 10, 10, 10, the triple 10. That first number is nitrogen. So you want to make sure that that's kind of um, somewhat reasonable. Maybe 10 or 5 is good enough. Then the next number is phosphorus. And the last number is potassium. So what we want to remember is that first number, even if you forget it's nitrogen, just remember it's the up, which means green growth. The second one is down growth, which is phosphorus for root. And then the last one is all around. So the last two really help to uh, produce beautiful flowers, which turn into beautiful tomatoes. So those are my top tips for keeping those tomatoes going into the dog days of summer. Do you think you can uh, handle that, Thomas? Absolutely. And if I may, well, I got you. Um, yeah. First time ever I've had an, another issue develop with my tomatoes. Mm-hmm. Um, I planted some tomato plants yeah. that were a little bit taller than normal this sure. past year. And although they performed well, it seems like now as we're getting closer to August, um, the vines, I guess you could say they're about two feet long. They're about two feet tall. Yeah. And the leaves have actually started withering down like turning brown almost like it's pruning itself sure and there's still on the tips of the plant there's still healthy green vegetation but the vines are looking horrible in the sense that um i feel like i need to come back and and prune the leaves off would it be a good idea for me to to do that or should i just let it grow the way it is to to prune some you mean or even plant the healthy green part into the ground would it keep growing oh right so okay so let's talk about the browning first and then we'll talk about what's going on so um without seeing the picture of the plant going off a description it does sound like perhaps um they have maybe gotten a, a little dry but um they could also be doing this call this thing called translocation big term but it just means different place and it's the plant is moving the plant is moving nitrogen and water and other things that it takes to grow from one part of the plant to the other parts of the plant if the browning seems to look its worst at the lower part the older part of the plant that would be translocation could have been though a little bit of maybe early blight early on um Tomatoes can get an early blight, and they can start to brown, and by this time, that damage would look pretty crispy. So, now what can you do about it? Of course, um, pruning a little bit uh, is not a bad thing because it will stimulate the plant to grow. Now, it is true that tomato vines, you'll notice, and, and for all of our listeners out there, you'll notice that on your tomato plants, somewhere along, there's these little groupings of little notches, little nodes, little bubbles almost. And those are um, adventitious roots, which just means adventurous. They want to jump out and become a root. Um, I want to be a root one day, they say. And they will actually start to root. So you can take cuttings from your tomato, go ahead and root them out, and plant them in the garden. And let's see, this is middle of July, August, September, October. You would probably have plenty of time for that plant to actually produce more more uh, tomatoes from you before it gets cold again. So definitely you could uh, either kind of mound some soil around the uh, the base there to encourage more root development to, to weather the storm, the weather the storm, weather the storm of heat that we're going to have. Or you could start taking some cuttings and start new plants. Does that make sense? You could just put them in like a little glass of water. I've done it that way and, and allowed them to root and put them in the ground. And they should have plenty of time since we're just uh, kind of middle of July here for them to grow uh, beautiful, d- delicious tomatoes. Tomatoes. Does that help some? That helps a bunch. Thank okay. you very much. Well, thanks for listening, Thomas, and thanks for calling in again. We love repeat callers, and and if you're out there growing, let's just do it together. All right. Thanks, Thomas. Have a great weekend. So today I want to remind you that uh, we will be having our plant of the week uh, before we leave the studio this morning, before the 10 o'clock hour. But you can give us a call, 706-865-3181. Email us, info at wrwh.com, and we'll be glad to answer your beautiful 
questions. You've got so, mail. okay, now it's time to go back to our mailbox from uh, Katie from Salty. She's just up the road a little bit from us. She says, "All right, let's see here. Are there any products that you would recommend to keep deer out of my garden? Something bitter, maybe? Yes, maybe a bitter old husband or grandpa would be one of the good solutions, especially if they have some type of shotgun. But no, I won't say that. Lead poisoning is very effective, but it's frowned upon in a lot of places. Um, not especially maybe this time of year. You got to make sure we obey the laws. Um, when I say lead poisoning, I do mean uh, use of artillery. But um, there are some other things you can do than sacrifice Bambi to the garden gods. You can use some repellents. Bitter is a good. I'm glad Katie brought that in. Bitter is definitely a, a good a good word to use, and not that necessarily bitter, but just bad tasting. So at the nursery, we sell a Bonide products. Um, Bonide is a company from, well, it's a Yankee company, but we love them because they are here to produce products for growers. They're not like some of these other companies that make aspirin and also horticulture chemicals. They're just marketing companies. But Bonide started in 1920s to help growers like ourselves. Now, they have a product that tastes very bad to the deer. It's called Repels All or um, deer and re- no I'm sorry let me back up it's called repels all repels all tastes really bad smells smells really bad tastes really bad it's got some it's all organic though this product is made of some essential oils like uh, clove oil garlic oil and my favorite to say is putrescent egg whites which really just means rotten eggs all of those things taste bad and uh, or smell bad and the deer do not want to come around it another product that bonide carries uh, uh, that we have at the nursery is a repellent and it's a, a taste thing but it's not bitter it's spicy hot and it's essentially oils out of hot peppers uh the oil of course is called capsaicin and this bottle is just full of so you got to be careful with it you would want to use some kind of gloves but you can apply it to the plant and once they take that first bite they're not going to come back and that will help not just deer but rabbits and other things like voles and moles and squirrels and other things that may uh, be trying to uh, take care of your garden uh plants but uh, another product we can use is called milorganite now milorganite is a product from milwaukee which is where it gets its name milorganite from the mill and it's an organic product it can be used as a fertilizer is actually how it's uh, marketed because it has great uh, nutrition in it. it's got wonderful amounts of nitrogen it's got iron in it as well so if you're looking to green up your lawn you can use it there but for you katie it smells pretty terrible uh, it smells bad to me, but the deer do not like it. It, it does kind of have to them a human smell. And so they're going to stay away from that. And I've used it in my vegetable garden, around the vegetable garden. You can use it around hydrangeas and hostas and things like that. And it's a two for one. Why is it a two for one? Because as I mentioned, it's a great fertilizer, but it also keeps those little guys away, which is wonderful. Smells are wonderful. Bitter tastes are wonderful because that's just what deer don't like. So we are going. I hope that helps Katie from Salty. We're glad you emailed us at info at WRWH.com. And oh, we've got another mail coming through. Thanks for letting me know, Buster. All right. So Jerry, Jerry from oh Oakwood. He must be. I must have talked to this guy. He's one of our probably our guys down south of Cleveland here. He says that he sprayed kudzu and English ivy with Roundup. Um, it killed the kudzu, but did nothing to the ivy. What is going on? Okay, so, uh, Jerry, you sprayed a kill-all product marketed as Roundup. Now, the actual chemical name is called glyphosate, which really uh, doesn't matter here or there. Uh, we sell a product called Cleanup, which is, guess what, glyphosate. So it's uh, cheaper than the Roundup because Roundup was the first company to come out with it, but commonly we do call it Roundup. But at the nursery, we call it Cleanup. Now, glyphosate will kill anything that is green and growing. Um, it's very safe. It only hangs around in the soil for about seven days. So you can plant af- seven days after applying this product. Now, I'm going to say that the reason your kudzu was damaged, but not your English ivy, is because of a waxy cuticle. Now, what does that mean? No, it has nothing to do with going down to the nail parlor and getting your nails did. Done whatever uh what it has to do with is a waxy layer of a product on top of the english ivy every leaf that's out there um has a cuticle of some form and that waxy layer helps to keep moisture inside the leaf the problem is with with english ivy is it has a very very thick layer of this waxy product we called cuticle now 
what's happening is the kudzu is pulling it into and through its cuticle, but the English ivy is resisting it, much like a dirty dish that cannot be washed with just water. We've got to have something that adheres the uh, chemical onto the leaf, and that word is called surfactant. Now, surfactant is basically like Dawn dish soap, where you're washing and cleaning uh, your your nasty, dirty dishes, trying to get that uh, st- stuff off. Um, that that soap breaks down the particles, and so that the grease and all can wash away. So, with the Roundup, what you can do is add a surfactant. Now, you can go and you can um, buy a surfactant that is produced by a um, you know, big company, and you can spend a little little pretty penny for that. Or what you can do is use some Dawn dish soap. You can use some Dawn dish soap. Now, that's not going to be found on the label, and maybe I shouldn't be recommending certain things that aren't found on the labels. But for for uh, herbicides, herbicide, sorry, I got tickled there. For, uh, for herbicides only, I would say you could use a little Dawn dish soap. But here's the key now, Jerry. What I want you to do is to mix the chemical, as it says on the bottle, and put it into your uh, put it into your um, your sprayer. However, you're doing that. And the last thing you do is add a drop or two of this Dawn dish soap. What that's going to do is it's going to help to break down the waxy cuticle. And if you do it last, it's not going to cause a bunch of flooding of cut of um, suds. You don't want suds to fill up that bottle. So try that out, Jerry. Thanks for giving us your email. Send it to us at info at wrwh.com. And you can call us. I'd love to talk to you at 706-865-3181. And next up is our plant of the week. So hang around, folks. We'll be right back. Local news, sports, and community information. 93.9 FM and AM 1350. We are WRWH Cleveland. Back to more Let's Get Growing with Nathan Wilson. All right, folks. So welcome back. We're in the home stretch now. Home stretch. Maybe I should think of the garden stretch. I think think of something different. Give us a call at 706-865-3181. We do have a few minutes. I'm going to present to you the plan of the week, but you can call, and Buster will be glad to take that, and we'll be glad to answer your questions. Or uh, send us a message at info at wrwh.com, and we can read it aloud in my beautiful, soothing voice. So today we have the plant of the week. The plant of the week is called Joe Pie Weed. Oh, some of you are like, I know that plant. Some of you are like, I have that plant. Some of you are like, I, I don't like that plant and whatever. There's a lot of things that happen with Joe Pye that I just love. They're blooming right now at the nursery, and I thought it would be a great time to talk about it. We're going to talk about Joe Pye and his loosely affiliated but estranged cousins. Uh, what I mean is there are several different types of Joe Pies. They're called uh, bone set. Um, some of them are known kind of commonly as ageratum, um, mist flower, um, white bone set, hollow Joe Pie weed, little Joe Pie weed. There's a bunch of different types of Joe Pie weed. Now, what is this plant great for? This plant is great for pollinators, especially for pollinators that need nectar and food source uh, in late summer and into the fall. Because as I mentioned, you'll notice that some are probably starting to bloom or have been blooming or will bloom right around you. This is one plant that uh, it really reminds me of the mountains because it seems like when you drive up towards the mountains, it's just growing in patches on the sides of the road. And it's particularly the large Joe Pie weed that you see. And they're just overarching the, the well, not really over the road, but it feels like this nice little garden you're driving through that God himself placed for us and our enjoyment. It's beautiful. Joe pie is a herbaceous perennial. What does that mean? It means that it never gets woody like a tree or shrub. It stays green and, and, and kind of lush, um, very soft wood, if anything. And perennial means that it, it comes back every year. Year after year, you will enjoy this plant in the garden. Now, one thing about Joe pie is that... Um, it does die down. So there's few evergreen perennials out there, but this is one that will, he will retreat. Joe Pye will retreat underground and uh, w- overwinter there until spring comes up and warms the earth and he emerges again, once again. So who in the world is Joe Pye and why does he get his own weed named after him? Well, you see, Joe Pye, this is how the legend goes. Joe Pye was an old North American Indian man. 
old, I don't know if he was an Indian chief, but uh, I like to imagine him as a chief. Now, what he did is he used this particular weed called, weed is a bad word to use. Weed is just a, a common word to use for something that generally was used um, to help medicinal issues. So, uh, Eupatorium is its common, is its uh, botanical name. So when I say weed, I don't mean that it's a true weed, weed, like I want to get out of the yard. I just mean it was used uh, to take care of uh, medical issues. And that's what Joe Pye did. He went and he, f- he had found this grateful New England man, a Yankee man who had typhus fever, not typhoid. This is typhus fever. And as the legend says, Old Joe Pye, he used this magical weed to induce profuse sweating and thus broke the fever. I don't think it's hard um, to induce profuse sweating on a Yankee man, but he did it with uh, Eupatorum and the fever broke. Typhus fever broke. And that's how it gets the name of Joe Pye weed. But now there's that other name I mentioned called a bone set. Now, how does it get that name? Does does it mean that you can apply this and it will heal a broken bone? Well, not exactly. Uh, Bone set. It became very popular around 1800s when this virulent flu swept through the East Coast. Now, what this flu caused was intense bone pain. You see, that flu got so far ingrained in your body that your bones began to ache, which I felt like that from time to time when I get sick. But uh, what this does is there was a man's uh, physician in the 19th century. His name was C.J. Hempel, and he noted, here's his words, quote, he said the herb so signally re- relieved the disease that it was familiar, familiarly called bone set. So it helped take the pain away from your bones. So in the garden, of course, bone, um, bone set or Joe Pye weed, whichever one you prefer, they come in a wide variety of colors. And sizes, heights, everything from 5 to 12 foot tall down to just about 2 or 3 foot and they do make beautiful foliage, beautiful flowers, uh, colors. Let's talk about colors of blooms from whites into pinks and purples and into kind of a blue color. Blue mist flower is, is really a gorgeous plant. And I'm going to tell you that I'm working on propagating a slew of those because they bloom so late in the year. They bloom so late in the year when nothing else does that just right before it gets cold, you can enjoy this beautiful misty blue flower. And of course, I don't know if they'll be ready this year, maybe not, but uh, maybe by next spring we'll have plenty so you can find that plant joe pie weed of course and miss flower a little later on at lanier nursery and gardens you can check us out at lanier nursery and gardens.com um, or you can of course send questions to wrwh here at the studio at info at wrwh.com now i know we have just a few more moments and we've just talked about the plan of the week but feel free to give us a call at 706-865-3181 Or email us as Austin did in Dahlonega. Here we are with Austin. He says, is it possible to plant and harvest ginseng in a personal garden? Okay, ginseng is become a very big, um, big uh, hot topic here lately in the order. Yeah, and I see uh, Buster over there rubbing his hands together like cash dollars because it is very expensive to grow. There is a native ginseng that just naturally grows around it is a little tougher to grow. It is a little tougher to grow. Um, you can grow it from seed. It doesn't really like to be disturbed. So it's like once you get it growing, you, you I think it takes, from what I remember, about two to three years to really get a root. Now, the root of ginseng is very interesting because it's kind of like a mandrake. It looks like this little human. Uh, I don't know if anybody's familiar with the Harry Potter series, but there is a segment in Harry Potter where they're growing this little squealing. I don't even know the name of it. I wasn't a big Harry Potter fan but I did watch the movies. They grow this little root that looks like a little baby, a little human, and it's underground. They pull it up and it squeals. Now, uh, ginseng does not squeal, but it does have this kind of head and then arms and kind of legs and looks like a little human. So can you grow in a personal garden? Yes, you can. It does prefer some shade, not necessarily things that, uh, not like a hot place, kind of a shady area, but it will take quite a long time. And um, you can definitely um, give it a shot. Uh, It is a native plant and it does have great medicinal value. You can find ginseng, of course, in the health food stores, um, as you can many of our native plants like aronia and, and of course, like we said, Joe Pye weed. So it's great to be able to grow these plants that are wonderful uh, native plants because they do help to attract pollinators. They help to attract birds and things like that. So, Jerry, give it a shot. 
Uh, sorry, Austin, not Jerry. That was our last one. Austin here. Austin, give it a shot, but it may be a little tough. Maybe we've got time um, got for just mail. one more. We're trying to get as many of your mail as we can. Really quick. Uh, Marie from Cleveland says her neighbor says there's a stand of poisonous sumac in between our property lines. I don't want my kids to get hurt by it. What can I do to get rid of it? Okay, don't do anything, Marie. Uh, don't do anything because it's not poisonous sumac. The sumac you see is um, most likely either smooth sumac or staghorn sumac. They're not poisonous. Su- uh, po- true poisonous sumac is actually a problem in South Georgia and in the wetlands like around Okefenokee. It doesn't really grow up beyond, uh, probably well below Macon actually. So um, definitely ID it to make sure, but uh, just because your neighbor says it, I don't believe it because I've never seen it around here and it doesn't grow here. Um, but if you do want to make sure that it's not poisonous, send us pictures of that plant at info at wrwh dot com wr uh, sorry info at wrwh dot com the sumac you have is going to be very ornamental they have a burning red fall color i say let's leave it and best of all it's not even poisonous at all folks i know we are nearing our time together here on this hour it has flown by so quick you need to make sure that if you are just joining in, you need to find us on YouTube. Uh, Google us. Uh, so go to YouTube and type WRWH, and you will find our uh, Let's Get Growing uh, recordings there. You can catch up or make notes from the show if you miss something, and you can see the old shows there. Or if you want to tune in any time of the week at WRWH, feel free to use the TuneIn app on your smartphone or... Or um, online at WRWH.com. Folks, this has been so exciting and so enjoyable. I hope that next week you will send us your questions, send us what you need to. And next week, I'll be here, 9 o'clock, and I hope you'll be here too. Let's get growing together, folks. Have a great weekend. Thanks for joining us for today's Let's Get Growing program with Nathan Wilson. If you have a comment about today's program, you can reach out to Nathan by sending an email to grow at LanierNurseryGardens.com. Join us next Saturday for Let's Get Growing on Local News Radio 93.9 FM and AM 1350.